everybody, this is Carol Rourke at Carol Rourke Studios. I'm glad you could join me for week three of painting the Delta landscape. So if you've watched week one and two, you know that the first week we established how I like to lay in a value drawing slash painting with a wash before I get started on the actual color part of the painting. Last week, we added in the clouds and started establishing those masses. Didn't all the way complete them. I just like to get a good establishment of the shapes and the values and somewhat of the color. It will adjust as we go on. Today, we're going to kind of start working on our landmass area and getting that colored so that we can get pretty much the whole painting will have some paint on it um, as we finish up this episode. So before we get started, I want to go over again with you what I have out on my palette today. So I'm working with titanium white. I have cadmium lemon, cad yellow medium, yellow ochre, cad red light, cadmium orange, and alizarin crimson permanent. I also have greenish umber, Viridian Hue, Cerulean Blue, Ultramarine Blue, Burnt Sienna, and then I have a pile over here, and if you remember last week, I talked about my gum bow pile. So what I do when I clean my palette off, like using a glass palette because I can scrape it clean, I'll take all the mixtures I've had for that day and mix them into a pile over here, and it's going to make some form of a gray. Now, why I like that is because I can use that gray to neutralize colors if I need to along the way. And because that gray is made up of the colors that I have put in my painting so far, it harmonizes with everything that's being used. Um, I like using a something I can stick my palette in and seal it up because I can take this when I'm done, stick it in the freezer, and then my paint is ready to go when I pull it back out so I'm not wasting anything. Again, if you are working with a limited palette, and you've heard me say time and time again, I suggest that you do until you know your colors frontwards and backwards. My limited palette would be Cadmium Lemon, Cad Yellow Medium, Cad Red Light, Alizarin Crimson Permanent, Viridian Hue, and Ultramarine Blue along with your titanium white. Oh, and I've also got Radiant Violet out over here. Um, it's another add color, but yes, it is a very pale purple. You will see me use it as a cool white almost. I use it to tint colors, just as the same thing I do. Sometimes I'll have a warm white out, which is a white with a little bit of yellow or orange added to it. Several companies make it. I have, I like Gamblin's Warm White. I have a warm white and a warm light yellow from Michael Harding that I really, really like. So there are things that you can add here and there to adjust your palette to the way you want it. I will say this, anytime I add a color that's new to my palette, I will do a little color study basically, where I will take the color and tint it down just to see what it does, how transparent it is how it holds its value, how it holds its hue, how it compares to another brand of the same color. This is just educational on my part. So anytime I try a new color, I do this. Okay, so let's talk about our land down here. So we did a little bit of work last week on the very back row of trees just because I like to get that edge nice and soft um, while those trees are wet. Now, if for some reason you didn't get there, it's not a big deal. And you will see this sky is not finished. We will be coming back into it as we go along. But I know I'm going to lighten the value down in there eventually anyway. So if you really need to revise your trees a little bit, you can do that. You can re-wet the paint on the back side of your tree mass and then work those edges together. We do not see a far off tree mass in focus. So we want that edge to be nice and soft. And the best way to get that soft is if, if the paint is wet on either side of it. So I did kind of establish a few um, shadow areas 
in this last week. Just something to build on today as we go. And we're going to work on also the field itself. Now, when I look at the field, and I know that my photograph is maybe hard to see here, but there are some very cool tones in the few rows that are visible. I'm going to be adding those. And like I mentioned in the beginning, I don't always work from a photograph. There's nothing wrong with working from a photograph, but I love knowing my subject. So I recommend when you paint, especially, it, it doesn't matter what it is. I was going to say landscape, it can be anything. Study it from life. It does not have to be a great painting. You might wanna hang on the wall, but get out there and observe from life. This field is right across the highway from our farm. I paint it three and four times a week. I know how it looks in the morning, how it looks in the late afternoon, how it looks when it's a gray day, how it looks when it's a sunset. I've got multiple plein air studies that I pull out to check my colors if I think I've taken a photograph that's uh, maybe not 100% just right. So those studies out there, now yes, Sometimes my plein air studies go straight to some of my galleries, but really I go out there and do plein air for note taking. I want to establish in my mind some muscle memory of the landscape that I love so much, and there's no better way to do that. And then when I bring the photos back in, when, and if I work from them, I can tell what corrections I need to make because photographs are never gonna see what your eye sees. Okay. So let's get started on our land. So we've got three main masses. We have the wall of trees in the very back, and that's something very, some, very, very normal in the Delta is you have this flat field and you have a wall of way far off trees, um, which I like because you can really study atmosphere looking at that. And then you can look at the delta and that's what you see every time you look. So I always try to find areas that have something extra just to break that flat ground, small vertical tree line up a little bit. Skies help, but I like to see other things in the um, landscape as well. So I have this little tree mass that's a little bit closer to us than the, the tree mass in the very, very back. So what I'm going to start with today and you'll see me picking up one of my favorite brushes that I use probably 90% of the time, which is a Trakel Hog Bristle number no. six. I have a rosemary that's this very similar in size. Um, and I also like, so I like this, here's a rosemary filbert number no. 10 I use a lot. And then here's a Blick Master Stroke Bristle that I, so they're very similar. Um, all three of these are good brushes. And I like to use the biggest brush. Now, there are a lot of painters that would paint this with way bigger brush than this. Um, this is a size I like because I can paint big with this, but I can also paint fairly small with this. Don't start out big paintings with something this size. All you'll end up with is a whole bunch of streaks. So there's a time and a place for a smaller brush, but we're not there at the moment. So I'm going to start looking at this little mass here, and I notice that we do have that shadow. One thing I notice in that shadow, it's a little bit cooler than what I've got on here right now. So I'm going to take a little bit of blue and just work in to that area. I'm gonna take a little cerulean, a little of radiant violet. I'll put a little of that over in this area. These are just some colors just to, it'll kind of be tucked in as I go. Okay, so this is kind of, um, this photo was taken, I'm thinking late January, so everything's still very dormant. And so I'm gonna keep things a little quiet. There are very few greens in this because most of this is still sleeping through the winter. So I'm taking a little cadmium orange and yellow ochre. I'm also gonna take that same mixture 
and add a little burnt sienna to it to give me another value to play with there, another tone. Now, these trees are vertical. That's how my strokes are going to go for the moment. So I'm going to come in. That's looking a little greener than I want as it hits that cool. So I'm going to throw a little Lizrian in this mix. That's better. Not thinking about individual trees, thinking about the mass. And think about it in three-dimensional shapes. So, like there's a vine mass here. And I'm even going to make a little bit of a violet color with some alizarin and ultramarine blue. There's kind of a shadow area right through here. I'll pull some of these trunks up. Think about the shape of the tops of those areas. into my sky. Now, you see me pull my knife out like I do a lot of times. I'm going to take a little cat orange and the radiant violet. Get kind of a neutral type lighter tone that I can hit when the light's hitting across this Stuff. So this is a mixture of trees, and if this was in the summertime, this mass would be covered in a vine we have around here. If you're from Mississippi, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're not, we have a vine called kudzu that is, there's no way to describe it if you don't know what it is, but it literally takes over an area of trees and completely covers them. We have it. Places around here in the summertime, they look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book because all the trees are covered in kudzu and they're just these big green mounds. So adding a little more of the violet tone in there. Cool this shadow down a little more. Use a little cerulean blue. Pull all this together somewhat. I don't want to start breaking it up too terribly much. Just scrape across that. You can also take your brush when needed and soften the knife down some. So that's all the attention I'm going to give to this area right at the moment. Okay, I'm going to go, to go back to the violet color, and I'm going to mix it into that light blue. And I'm going to pull some of the areas between these rows. I don't want, I'm not striping my whole painting. You don't see that many rows because eventually they start to kind of fade together. So I'm going to establish those a little bit. I think I'm going to add a little cerulean blue and radiant violet. And as they come toward me, I'm going to cool them down even more. They also get a little wider as they come toward me. Now, as far as the field itself goes, 
I'm going to take that whole mixture I had a minute ago and pull it together. I'm going to grab a little more yellow ochre, a little more cad orange, and a white. gives me a good mid-tone for my field. Notice I said mid-tone. It's not the lightest color I want in there. It's not the darkest color I want on there. And so I'm going to start stroking some of that on. As I work on this closer to me, this is grass that is growing, so it's, grass is growing vertical, so I'm going to do some little vertical type strokes. Now, closer back to this line of trees, I'm not having to worry about any kind of stroke because we're not going to see anything back there. Also, as we get further out to the horizon, I'm going to deepen this color up with some burnt sienna just a little bit. Now where that furthest group of trees, the mass way back here meets the ground, your eye is not going to see as harsh as an edge as you think. I'm going to soften. There is an edge, but it's, it's softer than, than most people want to paint it. Okay. I'm going to change to a little bit smaller brush. So I'm going to go with a Blick Master Stroke number six. I'm going to lighten this color down some. So my sun is setting kind of over here. So we're going to catch a little more light on the top of these rows on the right side. Just going to kind of lay that in. And then I'll start pulling that together. So I'm going to work these tones together with that. Because remember, in the very first video, I talked about knowing what your story is. My story is not about these rows. My story is about the sky. So I don't want to sit here and have a detailed version of every stalk of whatever was growing there. I just need a suggestion of the color and the tones. I want my viewer here. All these rows are going to do is pull you in so that you're there. So we're going to soften down that initial color we put in. Now, I will probably bring a little more texture in as we go, but only what it needs, not enough to detract from my sky. Picking up a little bit of that violet color again. Softening this stuff together. And they're just going to kind of fade into each other as they go out. Now, lighten all this up a little bit. 
take my knife. Get a little bit lighter color just buffed in there some. Not really texture. Just like to do this. And as I do it, some of those initial colors we put on first still peek through. I like the way the knife kind of skims across things. Again, you get that little bit of color vibration. And if anything shows up stronger than you want, just knock it down with your brush. Slightly mess this edge up against these trees because that was some grass growing up in there. So it's not going to have a mowed look about it. So I don't want it too perfect. Get this a little darker as it goes up through there. Here's and then while I've got it, I pull just a little bit of this light color into some of the light area up in the trees. Not a lot. Here and there. And I'm going to let this rest for today. Now, as far as my knife goes, I'm very, very picky about my knife. This knife is a Holbein knife that I've had for 20-something mm, years. Um, I love this knife. Sadly, they do not make it anymore. They make one that's similar, but it just doesn't have the balance this one does. And the funny thing is it costs almost twice as much. Uh, when I found out they weren't going to make this anymore, I bought a whole box of them. So I have them stashed everywhere. But as far as what I look for in a knife, you want something very flexible. So it's going to feel almost like a brush. You also don't want a little bit short knife. See how long that blade is? It's probably, I don't know, close to three inches long, maybe even a little longer. If you have a really, really short knife, it's going to give you a lot of short, choppy texture on, on your painting. And like I've mentioned before, my knife areas really don't have a lot of texture. Now, as I go on in a painting, if I have some really bushy areas in the foreground at the very end, I may take a knife and add some thicker stuff to give some texture in the foreground. But I can paint a whole painting with a knife and it'd be as, almost as smooth as if I used a brush. So, but they're fun to play with. I encourage you to try um, using one. And it, it's a great way to lay on paint when you're working wet and wet because it will allow strong pure pigment to sit on top and then you can take your brush and kind of soften it in. Um, there is a Blick knife that's very similar. Like I said, Holbein does still make a couple that are not exactly like this one, but very, very close. So if you're, if you're looking for a knife or wondering what I use, that's, that's what it is. So that's where we're going to stop today. Um, next week we'll start pulling all of the painting together, checking our values, checking our color. Um, may finish it. We I don't know. We'll just see how it goes. But anyway, I hope you'll join me. I post these each Thursday. Feel free to visit my website. It's www.carolrourke.com. You can email me from there if you have questions about anything you've seen on this video that you would like to learn more about. And until then, I hope you'll paint on your painting and I hope I'll see you next week.